when you're talking about counterculture people or post counterculture people or psychedelic people or, or, or whatever, I mean, we, we're sort of the other 1%. And in fact, I mean, one of the reasons, in fact, I, I had even gotten to know anybody was that I had a long distance feud with Timothy Leary before I met him um, because he he had started to talk about virtual reality, which had gotten into the news in the mid 80s for the first time. He started to talk about it as sort of the next psychedelic frontier. And, you know, I mean, he had just created this incredible divide, or well, he hadn't created it, but he'd exacerbated a divide in American society that I, I personally didn't think was that helpful. And I, I wasn't really into him doing it with <laughs> virtual reality. So I, I'd had a running argument with him from afar in, in the media that were available in those days, which were like these things called zines, which were amateur printed little newspapers and things that would be in underground bookstores. <laughs> and, <laughs> Shall I tell the story of how you, I met uh, Timothy Leary? You should Leary? definitely tell the yeah. story of how you met Timothy Leary. <laughs> yeah, so um, the way I met Timothy Leary was, um, so we'd been saying we should meet for quite a while because we were having this, this sort of long distance dispute. But I mean, it was good natured. And so he, he said... Um, can you, before you go into this, can you just explain a little bit more what the substance of your dispute was? What, what was his argument and what was yours that led to this meeting? His argument was that we needed to completely bust a Part, some kind of giant reductionist uh, technocrat ego that was ruining everything for everybody and we would do it with this kind of combination of arts and psychedelia and ecstatic feeling and it would create a world of uh, beauty and wonder and peace and I didn't feel that way exactly. I felt that I always had the suspicion of this idea that there's the good stuff and the bad stuff, this Manichaean fallacy that if you just find the bad people or the bad thoughts and then you defeat those and everything will be great. I don't think it's like that. I think to make the world better is a bit more of a subtle, gradual activity that involves problem solving and discovery and setbacks. I think being decent is um, a process that's hard. It's like doing science or, or working in technology, you have to get results. You don't necessarily know what'll work. And I, I, I view decency as this long-term difficult project, not just as this banishment of whatever was wrong with the world and then you'd enter into this sudden golden age. And so there's just a very different sensibility. So that's essentially what we argued about. And then you and decided think, to meet. Yeah, so we decided to meet. And so this Tim, is peculiar, what happens next? Well, to you, I mean. <laughs> well, I'm a square. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so let's see, uh, this is, when is this? This is in the mid eighties. And I get a call from uh, Timothy who is in LA and he says, okay, I have a contract by which I'm supposed to go to the Esalen Institute and teach a class. I'm getting paid for it. I'm happy to get the money. However, I would prefer not to perform my duties. <laughs> I'm not, this is not in Tim's voice. I'm, I'm completely paraphrasing. He had this, I wish I could, he had a, 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 this wonderful kind of slightly Irish accent. Well, Darren, you know, I, <laughs> I, these, these people, man, I, I, I think they're gonna be fine if I don't actually show up, I, I, something like that. And, and so uh, he, there, there was this guy who was running around LA being a Timothy Leary impersonator <laughs> for his living. So he hired the Timothy Leary impersonator. And so the idea was that the real Tim would show up and start the workshop. And then I was supposed to smuggle the impersonator in, in the trunk of my car. <laughs> and then the impersonator would take over once everybody was high and would have a harder time noticing that anything had changed. And then I'd grab the real Tim, put him in the trunk of my car and, and sneak him out past the guard gate. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd split, he'd, you know, arrange to share the fee with the, the, inter the impersonator. And so um, the first challenge is that I had this truly appalling jalopy. <laughs> That was, that's a whole other story, but I had this old Dodge Dart that was riddled with bullet holes and had no back seat and had been used to move goats around. I had hay in the back and I, what I had to do is uh, clear out the trunk, which was filled with early computers. And my friends helped me sort of create enough space in the trunk for Timothy to fit and for the impersonator. And we had to throw out some really cool old computers in this dumpster on the Stanford campus. And then I, I went down and, and did it. And I was like, terrified, I'd never done anything like this before, but it was like our little reenactment of 
of, uh, you know, East Berlin or something like, you know, I, I snuck Timothy out and um, that's how we met. 